Alrighty. We are now at module number eight, the actual midway point in the course. Uh, this lecture will cover building cybersecurity resilience. Because it's not all about defense, there's also resilience that we need to think about. There are a number of common elements that have to be part of a design to keep infrastructure up when a disaster occurs. Because it's never if, it's always when. Starting with geographic dispersal. By putting infrastructure across the world, either by using uh, cloud providers like Azure, GCP, AWS, having co-locations into various other places, you ensure that a single disaster, an attack or failure, cannot disable or destroy your systems. They'll remain on no matter what. within a data center, whether that's your own on-premises or even in different zones, placing systems on different racks in case of a single point of failure or other uh, power or other factors can play a role by having multiple racks with different power sources, different internet lines. Again, should something happen, other infrastructure can take over. There's multiple paths, multiple network paths. Should a, a internet line go down, like AT&T goes down or whatever, you have another way of getting out to the internet. In the same vein, on the LAN side, having multiple network devices, like multiple routers, firewalls, intrusion detection and prevention, load balancers, NIC teaming, all of these allow your network to have multiple ways to get data in and out. Because again, devices will fail, either by human error, by a power failure, by an attack, it's going to happen. And ensuring that your infrastructure stays on is one of your chief uh, responsibilities. So that can be having multiple switches that come online when something goes down. It always will go down. It's just a matter of when. Uninterruptible power supplies. Anything from these little guys to generators for longer outages. All of these are important means to keep the infrastructure up. Uh, don't forget that our entire career is based on having electricity. You cannot do your job without electricity. So you really want to ensure that your devices, your infrastructure is always powered because otherwise you're stuck. There's also systems and storage redundancy because again, things are going to fail. And in this case, disks will fail. It's just part of the life cycle and having different technologies. So not buying exclusively Cisco product everywhere, but having different brands or using stronger cryptographic solutions, different platforms or different controls so that a single attack or a failure doesn't have a complete impact on everything.
since storage will fail, having something like RAID is important to protect our data. A quick question, is anybody not familiar with RAID? I'm not familiar with RAID. Okay. A RAID is the redundant array of independent disks. You take a number of drives together and share data. Uh, these are the common RAID configurations. There are a bunch more, but the others get either get more complicated or you see in huge data centers. So for example, you have the uh, RAID 0, which is another way of just saying Stripe. All the, all the drives are sharing data and it is, it is all seen as one drive, but it's spread across. Uh, the, the positive of that is it's faster. The negative of that is should a drive die in the Stripe array, the data that was in there goes with it. There's no parity. It's just you know, whatever's saved on drive one is there, whatever's saved on drive two is there, and should a drive die, the data goes with it. RAID 1 is mirroring. Whatever is in one drive will be in another, an exact copy. You don't get the full length and breadth of all drives, but you do have redundancy. Should, a, should one of the two mirrors die, the other one has an exact replica. RAID 5 requires a minimum drive, a minimum three drives, but usually works with five. 33% uh, is taken from every single disk. That will be the parity spread across all five drives. Should one of the drives die, all four are still able to continue. You replace the drive and life moves on. Drive six just means that uh, two fifths is taken and to, if two drives die, life continues. RAID 10 is a mix of RAID 0 and 1. It just means it requires four drives. Two drives will be a stripe and two drives will be a mirror. So you have an exact copy of what two drives have. So you don't have the full uh, storage of four. You really have storage of two, but everything is copied. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. That's one way of keeping data resilient. Another way is backups. And there's a couple different types of backups that should be performed. Uh, the first one is a full backup. Everything on the device or storage system is put into a backup. If you continue to do full backups, you're going to get a lot of the, the backups are going to be big because it's an entire copy. And incremental captures the changes since the last full backup and it's faster because it's only capturing the changes. The downside to this is that it's slower to recover. So yes, you have your full backup and then if you go incremental, it'll only catch the changes since the last backup, which will make it quicker. But like I said, to recover, it's going to take some more time. There's a differential, which captures the changes since the last full backup and is faster to recover, but is also slower to backup. You also have the snapshot, 
captures the full state of a system or device at a time. You normally see snapshots in virtual machines. The last type are images, which are similar to snapshots, uh, but most often refer to a complete copy of a system at the bit level and are used in digital forensics. Where you store your backups matters. The decisions surround the capacity, the reliability, the speed, the cost, the expected lifespan, how often it can be reused before wearing out, and so on. Starting with tape backups. Tape backups are still around. Magnetic media is a very useful form of backup. They have the lowest cost per capacity. You will find online, when you shop online for tape backups, really huge storage media for tapes at really low cost. It's also the slowest to recover from, but it is great for long-term storage because of the way the media works. So it's easy to take a tape backup, store data that you want kept long-term, and put it away and it'll be fine. We have the magnetic or the solid state disks. These are more expensive for the same backup capacity as tape, but the two are faster than tape. You can put these together in large arrays like network storage, network attached storage, or storage area networks. There's also optical media, like Blu-rays, DVDs. Not as common, used as a large-scale backup tool, but they are a write-once type of backup. So you can write data to the optical disks and it will stay as is. There's also flash media, typically used for short-term copies or longer-term backups depending on the amount of data being saved. So with backups, not only do you need to decide your resiliency using full backups only, using incrementals, using differentials, the type of media that will save that data, whether it's tape, spinning disk, solid state, opticals, or flash, but also another decision with, is whether the backups will be online or always available or offline, having to be retrieved from a storage location. Offline backups are used to ensure an organization cannot have a total data loss. Again, this is where things like tapes shine because you can write to them, you can store them, and they will keep their information for a very long time. And should disaster strike of that magnitude, you could pull the tapes and uh, have the data be written back to a new array. And in a matter of time, you'll have your data again. There is also a middle between online and offline, which is near line. Not immediately available, but can be retrieved within a reasonable period of time without a human involved. Cloud providers have lower prices for slower access times and provide what is essentially offline storage with a near line access model. So things to consider. 
are the bandwidth requirements for backups and restoration time, the time to retrieve files and the cost of file retrieval, the reliability, and any new security models for backups. All these different ways, all these different things that have to come into consideration in order to keep our data, which is the primary thing we defend, safe from a total loss, which is inevitable and will happen because drives die, systems go down, ransomware could wipe data or just encrypt it all. And having these tools will help. So for example, if you were hit by ransomware, you could pull your tapes off the shelf and rewrite your data back. The tape won't be affected by ransomware because it's sitting on a shelf, completely disconnected. Or an optical drive, same difference. Responsive recovery controls. Response controls are used to allow organizations to respond to an issue, like an outage, a compromise, or a disaster. Recovery controls and techniques focus on returning to normal operations. Non-persistence is the ability to have systems or services that are spun up and shut down as needed, reverting to a known state or a last known good configuration. Remember that in Windows? There's all scalability, a useful response control for high availability systems. You see this a lot in the cloud. The two major categories are the vertical and the horizontal. Vertical is more expensive, requires a larger or more powerful systems or devices to help all tasks or functions. Horizontal will add more systems and can grow and shrink as needed. Both of these serve various purposes. For example, horizontal supports scaling with software defined services, whereas vertical can help during a natural or human disaster or equipment failures. So a vertical, having vertical scalability means that if a server goes down, we have physical servers to turn online and can help recover. Or if we have a lot of traffic, we turn on those other servers and bring them online in order to handle the traffic. But again, that requires having those physical devices ready to go. Horizontal, meaning we have a web application and it's getting a lot of traffic. So we use something like Kubernetes who will spin up multiple Docker containers of that web app and be able to process those requests without necessarily the need to have more physical hardware. But both have their places. Site resiliency is a critical design element with three major types. There is the hot site where all infrastructure and data uh, and staff are in place in case of an emergency. You have the warm site where some or all systems needed to continue work exist, but live data is not in place. And a cold site where space, power, and network are not prepared with system or data, but can be set up. Again, this is all around disaster. Should 
the organization's building catch on fire? Where do we go? Where do we go to continue work? Maybe we have a, a secondary site, like a branch site that everybody can move to and continue working. Or maybe we have space and we have some equipment at the ready, but it's going to take a little bit to set up. Or we just have a office building somewhere that doesn't really have anything, but we can move stuff in and continue life. There should be a restoration order based on what is most critical. Like network connectivity, network security devices, storage and database services, operational servers, login and monitoring, and whatever other services are required. Your restoration order will depend on the organization and what they, what each individual organization deems is critical versus not so critical. Some of the things are going to be the same everywhere, like DHCP, DNS, but other services may not always be critical. So you got to uh, put them in order. It's definitely not a one size fits all. Well, we can't talk about resiliency without addressing physical. Because security is both digital and physical. The two are one and should be always treated the same. So, site security. Site security could easily begin with industrial camouflage. Having a nondescript location that's largely unmarked and otherwise innocuous. This doesn't look like anything. It could be the office building of your organization. Nobody would really know. It could be where you store all your, your uh, organization's data. Nobody would really know. Can I just ask you, when you say no one would really know, just you're pointing to how kind of inconspicuous it looks? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, nobody knows what, just by looking at this picture, I don't know what company's here. Do you think that if this becomes common enough practice that that itself will look too inconspicuous ever? Um, like if people get the hang of this? Maybe, maybe not. I say maybe not because a lot of businesses do like to have a... a reception and this isn't quite the most welcoming and friendly place which is fine you could you could have another office that is the the front of the organization that looks nice and you have the the quote unquote back end where your database is sitting or your your data center and it looks like that Uh, fences are your first line of defense as a deterrent. You could throw barbed or razor wire to increase security. Now, mind you, I said it's a deterrent. Because it's pretty easy to get some, uh, uh, some wire cutters and make a hole. That is your first line of defense as a deterrent. Another one is a bollard, posts or other obstacles that prevent vehicles from moving through an area. Like all those infamous videos on YouTube of cars crashing into businesses. Lighting doesn't allow any shadowed or dark areas. This will discourage any intruder from thinking they can they can be all sneaky sneaky
having badges, either magnetic strip or radio frequency. The doors only open when a certain badge is presented. The wonderful and annoying alarms who detect and alert about issues, including unauthorized access, environmental problems, fires. Alarms can be remotely or locally monitored and they'll vary in their complexity and capability. Now a big um, asterisk nest next to alarms. Alarms that are too often or occur with great frequency are more likely to be ignored, disabled, or worked around by staff. So while alarms are great, you should always fine tune your alarm system so that people don't get f alarm fatigue and then not care when an actual event is occurring. There's fire suppression because again, we deal with electricity. So fires is definitely on our radar. You have the wet sprinkler systems, which use water, or dry sprinklers, which are empty until needed. There's the pre-action sprinklers that fill when a potential fire is detected. And deluge sprinklers that start empty but are activated and cover an entire area. Just many different kinds. There are many different brands. That's one of those things that you would need to talk with your organization about what you want to have because you definitely should have some fire suppression. Signage. Signage can remind authorized personnel they're in a secured area and non-authorized people should not be permitted to enter. Signs also help in court. If somebody, if a non-authorized person walks in, does something bad and claims they didn't know because there wasn't proper signage, and you did have proper signage, there's your proof. They can't, uh, they can't say they didn't know because you had the proper signage. It's actually a good idea to have on your equipment, whether on the banner or signs like this, saying, hey, only restricted people should be used, that does fly in court. Man traps ensure authorized individuals gain access to a secure area and prevents attackers from piggybacking. Also, if somebody unauthorized is trying to get in, you can just lock them within there and they can't get out. And the most common physical security control, locks. Locks are your most common physical security control. The most common digital security control is a password. And just like a password, locks are not a real deterrent for a determined attacker. Because locks can be bypassed, they can be picked, and or disabled. Continuing along the line of the physical is guards. Security guards are used in areas where human interaction is necessary or helpful. Guards can make decisions that technical control systems cannot, providing additional capabilities by offering both detection and response. Visitor logs are a common control used with security guards as they can verify an individual's identity, 
ensure that specific person enters the area they're supposed to. But guards are fallible because they're human and social engineering attempts can persuade them to violate policies or even provide attackers with assistance. Or in the case of this picture, just be distracted. Another common form of physical security controls is cameras and sensors, allowing observation in real time and capture footage of areas for future use. Motion recognition cameras are useful where motion is infrequent. They will have a buffer that will, re that will be retrieved when motion is recognized, so they will retain a few seconds before the motion started. These cameras can also help conserve storage space. There's also the object detection cameras that detect specific objects or have areas that they watch for changes. Closed circuit television displays what the camera is seeing on a screen. Common sensors include the motion, noise, moisture, and temperature, which can all be used for security and for environmental controls. Now let's say we need a, we need enhancing security for specific areas like data centers because they have all of our data so those areas are going to need higher security. That could mean having a two-person integrity control which basically means having two staff members provide access to dual keys, passwords, or portions of an access control factor. It could mean having things like Faraday cages to block electromagnetic fields from interfering with the, with the equipment. Uh, these Faraday cages would be used in high security facilities to prevent wireless communications from occurring. They're also used in digital forensics investigations to prevent a device in question from connecting to anything. Having demilitarized zones can be a logical or physical segments of a network to contain systems accessible to the outside world versus those that we don't want access to the outside world. There's also the physical telecommunications. Using unshielded cable does allow an attacker to put a wire sniffer and listen in on the packets as they flow through. So having locks, secure cable conduits, temper evidence seals on on uh, any cables that transmit sensitive information is important. When network security isn't sufficient, using an air gap design could be used, where devices are physically separated into network segments to prevent network connectivity between them. So you have two, basically two racks with similar equipment, but one cannot talk to the other because they are physically separate. Different cables run, different power, different everything. The last portion of resiliency comes around data destruction. 
because data does reach an end of its lifespan where it's no longer used, no longer necessary, and it needs to be destroyed. This is an important security measure. Uh, physical destruction is typically the most secure way to ensure that data is destroyed. You could use third-party solutions where the, a third-party company shows up, picks up drives, and takes them and, and shreds them, melts them, uh, just physically destroys it so that there's no way to retrieve that data. Because remember, just because you delete a file doesn't mean it's gone. It's still there. Tools can bring it back. And you really don't want to keep a drive, a physical drive around for too long if it handled sensitive data. When that data is no longer necessary, you really want to ensure that that is destroyed. So having methods like these, it's important to ensure that data is fully destroyed when it is no longer in use. Any questions? All, all these uh, methods can be used by a third party service or uh, internally by the company itself? Yes, in third party. And yes, if you have the equipment. Thank you. Um, I know uh, some friends of mine when they want to get rid of uh, solid state drives, they, uh, they'll they take them and, and either use a sledgehammer or use them for gun practice. Because again, physical destruction. Good luck putting the chips back together. Is that is that pretty guaranteed then that's no recoverable materials or any of these methods have some sort of and that's that's what you want is if you're going to get rid of a disk either physical or, or solid state or a flash disk you know and it had sensitive information you want it you want it destroyed in a way that there's no way anybody could bring it back my favorite is blowing it up to smithereens all right is there um do any third-party services uh, offer like insurance against oh anything? yeah if it was recoverable, they would. They would. There, uh, there are third-party companies who, yes, who you would sign your, your like your organization would sign up with them, and yeah, they would. They give you a certificate to say yes, your 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 drive was uh, defensively destroyed, like they melted it down or they shredded it into a billion pieces. But what's their liability if they screw that? Is my question. Oh, that, that would depend on the company itself. They, they normally have uh, all their policies ready to go. Um, I think the first one that comes into mind is Iron Mountain. Who I believe does this too. Dispose of records and assets. Security. It's just apparent that all of these companies have to have even more security in place than anyone else, because if they were vulnerable potentially to anything, it would be disastrous. Right, right, right. Yeah, um, I'm just pulled up their site here and they do have a media destruction service. Online portal, consistency, on-site audits. Oh, so we probably can, you could probably ask them. They're ISO compliant. That's good. Yeah, so I think with Iron Mountain, you would, you would contact them and say, hey, can we get some of this information to see what your liability is on, on getting rid of our, our disks and what, um, what happens if you mess up in some way? I mean, if they messed up in some way, they would fall uh, short of the of ISO and would get in so much trouble. 
I'm kind of surprised they don't have uh, their policy just easy to reach. Yeah, they have to have that. That's a good one. And again, I'm surprised I it's just not an easy click. Trying to find another one with their info. Hard drive destruction, hard drive wipe, meeting the DOD requirements of wiping, that's cute. This site seems a little shady. I, I, I was just wondering like, what a great business to start, like some sort of insurance company uh, that you're selling to Third, that's that that's separate from a third party construction service. So you have double protection if you're a company. Somehow you can. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that's quite thought out yet. Sorry. Subject to local availability. Shearing or crushing. Here we go. They have a chain of custody, they a um, barcode, they do GPS, they give you a certificate. HIPAA compliance, cool, cool. Info sheets, maybe is what I'm looking for. Policies and positions, maybe. Anti-corruption policy? Ooh. What, the, what you got here? Mm -hmm. Safety payments, facilitating, hospitality, gifts and promotions. Third party reps. No, nothing important here. Yeah, that'd be uh, right. to find. It, it did say consequences for violating this policy right before you clicked away there. But that's all right. Mm, the consequence violations resulted in severe civil and criminal penalties. We don't really have much litigation in place statewide or federally around that, I don't believe. People are, they re-verify this every year. Cute, cute. It'd be nice to find their, um, their actual policies on that I think that's going to be one of those like giving them a call to see what what they have because here it's all about their service the things that they destroy They use, oh, these guys use a hydraulic shear or crusher. They've patented both their processes, it looks like. It'd be nice to have their policies publicly available. Uh, white paper certificate and reporting these guys are in Brooklyn 
New York. We have some certifications, cool. Some ISO ones, cool. Yeah, I think it's gonna be one of those talking to them to see what their their uh, liability is, what they have. Because seeing the, that you know, these three or four that I've clicked around, that they have their, their ISO certs, and, and some of them say, hey, we shear or crush, like these guys. And here you, you get a certificate of destruction, including HIPAA and FACTA compliance. I mean, ethically, like they're not really responsible. They're, it's not really in their best interest as a business, is it really? I guess it is, but isn't it fall in legislation to kind of push them to be more accountable that way or am I wrong? I mean, it'd be nice, but you know, our, our legislation is pretty slow in catching up with technology. Although the, uh, the certificates are valid in court. The certificates of destructions are, uh, a court will accept them as, yes, this, this drive was destru defensively destroyed and there's no way to bring it back. It just depends on the court case, how like valuable that could be to the client though, because, uh, not only obviously would you have to go through litigation if there was some, if they screwed up, let's say, um, somehow, and they were able to prove they, they weren't, you weren't able to prove somehow that they screwed up yet the files were distributed after they were supposed to have said destroyed them. I'm, I'm making up a hypothetical scenario that would be challenging in court for that to hold up, but. Yeah, that would be interesting to find. Yeah, to my knowledge, once you get that certificate of destruction, that's that's the the proof that you're fine. But yeah, you know, who knows? <laughs> I'll look into it. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, no problem. No problem at all. Oh, two things before we end the stream. The work this week is doing the complete beginner a learning path in Try Hack Me and showing proof that you completed that. I don't expect you to finish this in one week. Just complete it before the semester ends. The second thing, because we are now at the midway point of the course, I want to remind you of a, a little policy that I have in my courses. And no, it's not the due date one. It's the certification. If you get, in this case for CIS 75, the Security Plus, if you take and pass the CompTIA Security Plus exam, you get an automatic A in my course because you achieved the goal of the course, which is to take and pass that specific certification. On the homepage, there is a link right here where you were you will take to the X voucher site. You select Cabrillo. And in here you'll find the Security Plus voucher. That is 49% off of the full price of the exam. Again, if you take and pass the Security Plus exam, you get an automatic A. I do not care what point value you got in the test. As long as it says pass, that's all that matters because nobody asks what score did you get in your, in your Security Plus, they'll just ask, did you get it?
So, once again, there is this available to you all. You can get the test for 49% off. If you take and pass the Security Plus exam, you will get an automatic A in the course and won't have to do anything anymore because you passed the class. Again, taking and passing the Security Plus exam is the whole point of this course. So if you do that, well, I see absolutely no reason to make you do any more work when you achieve the goal. Any questions? Is that just the, I'm not, just two attempts possible? I mean, let's say you take a first attempt, you don't pass it, and you pass it on the second attempt. Would I still get an A? Oh, I don't care how many attempts you take. All, all that I care is that you took and passed the test. Thank you. The, this thing should let you do multiple attempts. This thing at the very end of the uh, module 14. Uh -huh. uh, if you are thinking about jumping on, on this, um, uh, on this track of actually getting the cert, I highly suggest doing the, the, the practice as many times as you can. Uh, the questions that I have gathered together in here are closely related to the ones that you will find in the actual certification exam. So they will not look like the ones that you've been doing at the end of every chapter. They will be much harder. Uh, I have used them to take and pass my Security Plus. So I definitely recommend that you use that exam and practice as much as you can if if it is your goal to get this cert and it does allow you multiple attempts with an unlimited number for that very reason because i want you to be able to use it as a resource to practice yourself and hopefully pass This may just be mine, but it's. I'm trying to click on that right now. It says this quiz is part of an unpublished model and it's not available yet. But I'm looking at yours. It says it's published. Oh, 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 oh. There. Refresh your screen. There, one sec. there we go. Thank you. I guess I forgot to click on the little thing. Oh, well. There. Easy fix. No problem. Thank you. So yes, knock you. yourself out. Let me know. If you've taken, if you've taken past the thing, uh, then the only thing I request is the, the document that you get at the end that's, that shows you and, and that you passed, and that will be enough. I also don't see the homepage that you were showing with the link to get the discounted voucher. Uh, click on Pages, and that should take you to this. It's supposed to be the first thing you see, the front page. <laughs> I've never seen it. I click on home and I get to the same thing as I see when I click on modules. Um, same oh, here. Let's see. Navigation. Let's put pages up here. And save. And reload your, your uh, thingy. and then click on pages and this should be the first thing that shows up. I see it when I click on pages. I still don't see it when I click on home, just when I click on pages. That's weird. Oh, Canvas is a little weird. But thank you. Yeah, no problem. Anything else before I stop the stream? I did have a question about the NCL. Yeah, fire away. Um, 
as our coach, what and I don't really understand what that means. Oh, it just means that I can see your score. Okay. So you can see my progress in like the gym and the preseason and Yep. That's exactly what it means. Okay. But we're not allowed to get any assistance from you is my understanding. Who has said anything about that? <laughs> at least like I don't know about the preseason, but at least like the the in the games I thought we weren't allowed to get assistance from our coach. Uh I don't know where you read that. Oh, we are? I I'm not enforcing that if that's the case. You're learning security for the first time. Why the heck would I throw you deep in and go, good luck? Forget that. What? I think I'm doing okay for being thrown in the deep end so far. I mean, if you want to, if you want to be thrown in the deep end and, and, and go for it, then go for it, Batman. But I'm not going to force that. I, I kind of was under that impression, but I, I didn't actually read. I don't know exactly where I got it from either. <laughs> Uh, I think you uh, you just thought that because it's a it's a game you automatically thought oh I should do this on my own and uh, no if you don't feel comfortable doing it on your own then don't you're learning cybersecurity I don't expect you to be geniuses and know this already now later on. Let's say in the in the spring game, if you want to actually compete, that's another story. But I'm not expecting you to compete. I'm not expecting you to to fight for first place. I want you to to like a buffet. I want you to try different things, see what you like, and more more or less have fun with this. Not be tedious and stressful. Oh, it, I I spent most of the day yesterday on the preseason. Had a lot of fun. Good. But yeah, don't feel like you have to do it all on your own. Okay. And then um, what's the criteria for getting full points on the for the individual and team games? <laughs> uh, you ready for this? I, I hope you're sitting down. Sure. As long as you play you get full points. So the couple days, so like the, the eight hour stints <laughs> of learning is, um, I, I've done it a bit too, Karen, because it's like, it's challenging to learn. So, but yeah, that's good to know. I want to learn and I will anyway, but it's neat to know that participation wasn't like <laughs> completely contingent upon. Oh, that, yeah, that's why in the, in the thing, it doesn't say you have to score X amount. It just says, show me you played. Case in point, myself. I hate programming. So I wouldn't do any of the programming challenges. I would do the network analysis because I love Wireshark and I love that stuff. That's my jam. But... I wouldn't want to do programming challenges. And if my grade depends on doing the things I don't want to do, well, that's going to suck. So, yeah, all I want you guys to do is to play the game and hopefully find the things you like, because that's the stuff that will help you determine what you want to do as a career in cybersecurity. Because it's not cyber isn't isn't just defense it can be pen testing it can be digital forensics it can be network analysis reverse engineering uh we have many branches in this field and this is all about finding out what thing you want to do and security plus is one of the the those entry level certs that you need to get because it rounds you out but i'm also thinking beyond of what is the thing you want to do so playing games like ncl will show you a variety of topics and will help you figure out like hey cryptography is not my thing so maybe i'll do like the easy stuff in crypto and call it a day but go do this other subject because i really like digital forensics i'm not gonna punish you for that that's the whole point so yeah 
I didn't, I purposefully in the instruction didn't say you need to get X amount or play this amount of time. It's just play. The more you do, the better it'll be for you because you can come back later in the next season and actually compete and get, and at the end, you could use that report in your resume. But at least you will have gone through it once and you know what it's like. So you will be ready for next round when you want to do it for reals. So, uh, yeah, use Discord. Talk to each other. Doesn't matter to me. That's why I built that community so that you guys can chat with one another. And when are you doing the next round of grading? I should be doing the next round of grading tomorrow. Cool. And I'll post it in Discord that I'm about to do it. Just so you have the heads up. But yeah, I should be doing it tomorrow. So if there is any work you want uh, graded, get it in by tomorrow morning. Once we get closer to the end, I'll start doing it much more often, like every week. But yeah, I'll, I'll constantly announce it before I do it. Other questions? Are there going to be more questions for the mini CTF or are we done once we get through what's already posted? Um, I have not added more. And I think I went all the way to 17, or did I not? I did not do a chapter 17. You went through 13.1. Yeah, 13.1 is the last one. Yeah, I'm not adding anything else. Okay, great. I finished writing the class like two weeks ago. I'm not adding more. I'm done. I've moved on. Cool. 